Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Venu Menon, and I'm the director of the Cardiac Intensive Care Unit at the Cleveland Clinic, and I want to welcome you to this session on advances in cardiac critical care. Uh, with me for this session is Paul Kremer, who's Associate Director of the Cardiac Intensive Care Unit, and Penelope Rampasad, who's the Chief Quality Officer of our CICU. And today we're going to talk a little bit about where the CCU was started and how it's evolved over time. And so to give you a little background perspective, you know, the CCU really started when Jasmine Julian decided to bring all the patients with an acute myocardial infarction into one place in the hospital because the main threat at that non-reperfused era was the, debt, the threat of electrical instability and ventricular uh, fibrillation. And so just having trained nurses in a room to quickly recognize this complication and defibrillate patients in the post-infarct setting led to a dramatic decline in mortality rates with this condition. As we evolved into the 1970s and 80s, acute reperfusion therapy became a major, major advance in our field. And then as primary PCI came along with Hartzler in Kansas City, we started to have two competing strategies to develop acute reperfusion care. And so the CCU really became a hub for reperfusion trials and for reperfusion decisions as to who was the optimal PCI candidate versus who was the optimal patient for reperfusion therapy with fibrinolysis. By the late 1990s, we knew the answer to this. Most patients in the United States should get appropriate, timely primary PCI. And so the CCU, in many ways, had witnessed a complete transformation of acute myocardial infarction care in the United States. But what we did start to notice in the turn of the century was that the profile of patients in the CCU really began to change. And rather than call ourselves a coronary care unit, we started seeing ourselves as a cardiac intensive care unit because the kinds of patients who we began to see, the kind of interventions that we began to do, all began to change. And so, Paul, I was wondering with that background, uh, what is it that occurred in the CCU in the early part of this century that made us really revisit what this unit was all about? Right, and, and thank you, and it's good to be with you. And, and I think as you articulated, Dr. Menon, in some ways we've been a victim of our own success. So we've been very successful with early revascularization in the setting of acute myocardial infarction. Uh, so now our patients live longer, and with that comes advanced comorbidities. And so now when they present to us, they're older, they have renal disease, they have lung disease, they have, have advanced vascular disease, valvular heart disease. So these patients are much more complex, I would say, in terms of the breadth of illness and comorbidities than what we saw uh, in decades past. Um, and I think related to that, the spectrum of illnesses that we take care of is much broader than what it used to be. You said it was a coronary intensive care unit and we now think of it as a cardiac uh, intensive care unit. And what are some examples of that? Well, I think first we think about, um, as a topic you know very well, how we deal with, with cardiogenic shock. And I think we have a lot more options for support uh, now uh, in, in recent years to preserve end organ function as we figure out what we're going to deal with the heart. Uh, second, uh, I think with patients with advanced uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, we often see uh, intractable ventricular arrhythmias. Um, so now not just defibrillation, but we can support patients through things like electrical storm, VT storm, and with our electrophysiology colleagues, ablate and help some of those patients. Uh, third, I think as we do more procedures, we put in more valves, we put in more pacemakers, we're seeing the consequences of all that foreign material with uh, endocarditis and device-related infections. And I think we've gotten very good at getting all that infected material out, at uh, uh, either with the electrophysiologist extracting the devices, or often with the surgeons uh, doing uh, advances in surgery where it's very important to debride and remove all the infected tissue, uh, and often using advanced surgical techniques like the use of aortic homographs or reconstructing the aortic mitral intervalvular fibrosa, a so-called commando uh, uh, procedure. Um, and finally, I would say how we deal with acute aortic dissections uh, uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic. I think there's been uh, always recognized as a surgical emergency, 
Uh, but now we have uh, new techniques, uh, in particular with descending aortic dissections, endovascular techniques, and even uh, in the ascending aorta for patients who aren't surgical candidates. So I think, the, 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 as you mentioned, the, the, we've gone from a coronary intensive care unit to a cardiac uh, intensive care unit, in part related, one, to we've been so successful at primary perfusion that now our patients are older, have more co comorbidities. Uh, in particular, the burden of heart failure in the modern CCU is something to be highlighted. And two, we're dealing with a much broader range uh, of diseases uh, that are primarily cardiac problems, but not just acute myocardial infarction. I, th I think it's really important. And I think what we've seen as a result of this kind of disease is that a number of people on mechanical ventilation, the number of folks needing renal replacement therapy, the number of folks with large bore accesses that are there for long periods of time have all increased. And with this comes all the other things in the ICU literature that we were initially unfamiliar with in the car cardiac ICU. And I think what this really warranted was a a little transition in who actually were the folks who began to run these CICUs. And I think we started thinking about cardiac intensive care as a subspecialization of general cardiology. And with me is Penelope Rampasad, one of our early staff in this area, who's double board certified both in cardiac cardiology as well as cardiac critical care. And I was wondering, Penny, if you could tell us from your uh, opinion, what is it, what extra skills should a superb clinician who runs the CCU have to be the cardiac intensivist of tomorrow? Wonderful, thank you for having me, Dr. Menon. Um, really, in terms of thinking about the needs for patients going forward in the CCU, uh, the complexity of care, as Paul highlighted, is, has increased significantly. And with that, given the intensity and the complexity, I think the foundation continues to need to be a cardiologist within that unit, um, but with some value added. And there is a lot that we can lend and learn from uh, our colleagues in critical care. Uh, and specifically for myself, that's where I, I went to get my additional skill set. Uh, when we think about the complexity of the patients, uh, their duration of hospitalization, and the sequelae that come with that, a lot of the time our patients are presenting needing to be on mechanical ventilation. Uh, so really being able to understand um, hemody or rather um, uh, mechanics of mechanical ventilation, um, being able to appreciate heart-lung interaction is something that's specifically, I think, in need within the CCU as an area for development and a skill set which is required. Uh, being able to do bronchoscopy, uh, being able to manage complex airways, um, thinking further along and, and down the patient, um, renal replacement therapy, CRT uh, continues to be an ongoing need, and really being able to have a vantage and appreciate the different subspecialty areas within cardiology to be able to crosstalk and liaise with your colleague to be able to make the call to the surgeon and say, I think that this is what's needed to create that dialogue. Just given the complexity, there is no mastery of it all, but at least being able to have an appreciation of where the needs are and being able to, uh, to advocate for that for the patient continues to be important. Um, imaging continues to be an area, I think, uh, where we need to continue to grow within critical care cardiology um, to be able to handle all of our diagnostics as well uh, to really move on to the next step and advance the patient. And I think it's with that background that we actually uh, designed a cardiac critical care sub-fellowship about four or five years ago. And we have a one-year fellowship after general cardiology that deals with many of these issues. And uh, Penny, uh, can you just talk about, for, for fellows in the room or other young trainees in cardiology aspiring to be in this space, uh, a little bit about our curriculum for someone who's doing one year in critical care after doing three rigorous years of general cardiology. What, what, do, what does our fellowship look like and what do you come out trained to do? Right. I think our, our uh, foundation prepares us wonderfully uh, where we see all of uh, the fellows who have trained with me uh, ending up our kind of formidable places in terms of being able to care for complex patients and really the foundation of that has been uh, with us being able to liaise with our colleagues in both in the medical ICU and the cardiovascular ICU. Um, so spending dedicated time within the medical ICU, being able to appreciate mechanical ventilation. Uh, within the CV ICU, looking at mechanical circulatory support. Uh, typically our fellows spend time in the heart failure ICU, 
looking at advanced supports, um, being able to uh, appreciate indications for um, temporary as well as, uh, as long-term um, mechanical circulatory support, um, imaging time spent uh, within TEE, uh, CT, um, bronchoscopy suite. Um, those are some of the major things as well as the opportunity to focus further on, on kind of niche areas, nutrition, things like that, that we neglect often uh, within our units, um, which really kind of in the long term contribute to uh, the longevity of the patient actually being successful and moving forward. And Paul, I think, you know, we've all realized that, you know, it's in these time sensitive illnesses, we do things by reflex and the database that we're so used to in other areas of cardiology just does not exist in that same robust fashion that we, that we are used to in other areas. And I know you've been privileged to be part of the C3TN critical care trials network that David Morrow has been running out of the Brigham and we've been an integral part of it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about both the need as well as the challenges for us to be doing real evidence-based research in this environment. Sure, and, and thanks, thanks for highlighting that. I think um, part of the C3TN uh, registry, which, we're a part, uh, which we participate in, is to highlight really ho how the cardiac intensive care unit has changed with some of the things that we've mentioned uh, in terms of the comorbidities of our patients, um, in terms of the burden of heart failure uh, in our patients, and in terms of uh, defining, for example, what are the causes of shock. Uh, so for example, we know now in the modern CCU, um, about 20% uh, or so of the patients may come in with mixed shock. And so uh, to be able to, to study that across a wide range of CCUs in North America and appreciate practice differences and differences in practice patterns and see where there are similarities and differences, I think is very helpful for us to know as a field where we're going. Uh, but to take a step back, I think in, in, in general, uh, which you alluded to, if I, I think of the care of the patient in the cardiac ICU, I really think of, of a couple of steps. I think the first step is the rapid recognition of what the primary problem is and what the response is going to be to that problem. And that's where our skill sets as cardiologists, our skill sets as imagers, our skill sets of intensivists are of the utmost importance. And then once we've dealt with that or we're trying to get to the best outcome, that's where really the, I would say, the, the importance of the team is paramount. Your respiratory therapist, your pharmacist, uh, nursing. And that's where I think uh, also the skill set that people like uh, Penelope bring as intensivists really help us. Um, because I think, frankly, as cardiologists, uh, that's been an area where we have lagged behind uh, some of our intensivist colleagues. And I think the 3CTN registry, um, internally and, and more broadly speaking, offers opportunity to identify this area where we can continue to improve the care uh, of patients in the cardiac intensive care unit. Yeah, I think that uh, you bring up some really important points there. And I think the other part that I've been struck with is that despite the dramatic advances that we've had, you know, uh, futility is still there in this situation. And to pull the trigger and when to pull it and whom to uh, perform these really invasive uh, studies uh, in the attempt to improve quality of life and longevity and in whom we sit back and allow them a dignified debt has been a tremendous challenge. We have a whole lot to learn about that. So Penny, what are your insights about how we, dev uh, we deliver palliative care in our CICU? I found that since I've, I've transitioned to the clinic that the way we deliver palliative care here is, is quite progressive in that we tend to bring palliative care in early on. Um, typically, a lot of my patients with mechanical circulatory support, I find that we bring palliative care on early in the conversation. And it's not necessarily to say that we're making a decision about life or death, but we introduce them to services, provide them with support, recognize that there's an entire package of care which comes along with palliation, whether it's treating symptoms or having an extra person at the bedside who's helping to explain things to family, having social supports for them. Um, so being able to bring palliative care in early along um, and allowing them to see the patient through the trajectory really helps to build uh, alliances with family and allow for decision making when it needs to happen. Um, and I think um, some of the uh, uh, reflection that we've been able to look at within our unit uh, is that we are seeing palliative care get involved a little bit sooner 
and also having those goals of care discussions earlier on, just appreciating that uh, the trajectory can be very variable, um, but trying to get a sense of uh, what patients' wishes are uh, at the time of presentation. Yeah, you know, I think, so the CSU has really become this transformational place where your time-sensitive emergencies require emergent decisions that can really change a person's life. And I think it's been a privilege to work in that environment over the years and see what it's transformed to actually being. And I think uh, the privilege of often shaking somebody's hand in a 24-bed CCU who's actually not going to be alive the next day is really, really humbling in this area. And so for young folks in the room who are doing cardiology, uh, I think this area is going to be one that is only going to blossom. There's going to be more research in this area. There's plenty of opportunity. And I think we need uh, all the good folks uh, to join us because I think the uh, intensity as well as the quantity of care that we need to deliver in in this space is only going to escalate with all the other wonderful things that Paul said we do up front. So thank you for listening to us on this little vignette into where we think the CICU came from and where it's going. We hope you uh, enjoyed this. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on this conversation today. Uh, best of luck.